Wonderful. Thank you, ladies. <coughs> Kristen and I were kidding with Abigail before service. Abigail said she was going to stand in the middle because she was the tallest. And uh, I said, well, Kristen, don't feel bad. They make me stand on the end, too, because they're taller than I am. <laughs> that was a wonderful song, wasn't it? Amen. Really, really shows how much God loves us. Yes. And it's amazing to me with, and, and I'm this way, I mean, we're, we mentioned last week that if we're honest, we're very comfortable and we forget even this time of the year what God did for us. Very easy, isn't it? It's easy to get caught up in all this going on and not really take the time to, you know, and even, I know, you know, people say that Christmas, they'll... But Shane, they'll say, oh, we did a birthday cake for Jesus. I'm like, okay, well, that's good, I guess. But I think, honestly, I think he'd rather us remember him all year than, right. and I like birthday cake, by the way. But um, right. well, he sure has been good to us. Yes, sure has been good to us. And uh, I was studying uh, this afternoon on a message I'm working on for Easter and uh, it's out of Ephesians 1 7 and uh, you know something we don't really preach on sing about a whole lot anymore is the blood yes, sir. and uh, the fact is that you know we're, we're in brother Adam we're in a day where it's almost like you have to sell Jesus to people, or that at least that's the mindset. You know that you, you have to people, are in, you gotta you gotta make him the solution. You know if they're having this issue or this issue, it's like, well, let me tell you how Jesus can help you there. And and we've kind of gotten away from the fact that the essence of who he is and what he did is he shed his blood. And that's the most important thing. I mean, you know, if he never fixes your financial problem, right, or if he never fixes your health problem, um, the most important thing we can share with people is that he died for you and as you so you don't have to go to hell. And so I appreciate the good song. Uh, you can turn to uh, Proverbs 30 tonight. I am going to preach, and I think we're going to finish up Proverbs this year. And uh, I want to say again that... Um, a couple things. I'm very thankful for what God's done for us this year. Um, I think that when I, I've tried to take the last few weeks of the year and do a couple things, uh, really hone in on what I need to do and our church needs to do next year, but also want to take some time to reflect of what God's done this year. And, uh, you know, last year we introduced our theme, Let's Find Out. And really asked you to let's stretch our faith and, and really find out what God can do. And if, if we can't trust that he can do the things that he says he can do, then we just probably just need to close the church down, go home, not come to church on Sunday. Right. Because really it's, it makes no sense to, to go through the motions of trusting God if we're not going to trust him. That's right, right. And, and we've seen God do some amazing things we've seen souls saved and families join the church and some of you have seen miracles not only uh health wise but people you'd prayed for and family and friends that you've tried to get in church and different things and and God has answered that and one of the things that it's very easy to do is when you've pushed hard and you feel like you've had some success is to take some time and to back off and go, well, you know, that's over with. Now let's just kind of go back to status quo. And you kind of go back in that law of being comfortable, right? Yeah. And, uh, and so we're not going to do that. We're, we're going to, you know, if we're at a level two, it's time to go up to a level three or four, right? I mean, we don't want to go back down to, let's, well, we're starting all over again. We're, we want to build on that momentum. And so... I want to just share with you, I'm not going to share a lot with you because uh, I want to share that with you later, but when I think a few things, here's what I would do, and we've got, you know, uh, what a week, uh, almost two weeks left in the year, and uh, then once you get to Christmas next week, it, that's it, right, you got one more week, 
And so um, I think what I do is what I'm going to plan on doing is kind of catch my breath. And then, you know, a lot of times at the end of the year, people are like, well, you know, once the first of the year starts, what I'm going to do, I'd go ahead and start making my preparations for the first of the year. So, okay, take a week and kind of catch your breath. But then a lot of times what happens is, well, first year I'm going to start X, Y, Z, and then all of a sudden it's February and you had to start X, Y, Z because you're catching up on stuff you didn't do in this year, right? And, and so I think what I would do in every area of life, and especially spiritually, is to go ahead and start making preparations and praying, saying, God, what is it you want from me next year? Good. And as a church, a few things I would like us to, to be aware of is, number one, um, we need to do a better job, and, and I'm not complaining. Please don't misunderstand me. I just know that there's always room for improvement. Um, we, we need to get more tracks out. Good. I mean, we, we need to, you know, I don't know how many uh, we hand out this year, but next year we're not going to say, well, that's good. Let's just, uh, no, we need to improve, right? I mean, more. And that, that's going to be on all of us that, that we hand out more tracks. But here's the other thing I, I want to, I think uh, our bus ministry needs to go to another level. I think that if, if every one of us in here tonight, you'd pray and say, God, will you lay somebody, one person, at least one person on my heart that I want to see saved and get in church and, and be discipled or someone who's out of church uh, that needs to be in church. It, it, think about that. If, if we all did that, but what happens is we, we get overwhelmed and say, well, you know what, uh, you know, I, 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 I can't do that. You can. We, you just got to be focused. Now think about what uh, Jesus uh, thinking about him that that he was moved with compassion, Amen. and and when you see that you realize that that his eye affected his heart, and our eye affects our heart. And a lot of times we get so caught up in the busyness of everything that we forget that you know when uh, you know people. I mean, if we believe, Brother Johnny, Jesus is coming back like we say we do, right? It, I think a lot of times we don't really, or we, we are so caught up in our world that we're saying, I can't wait till Jesus comes back because then I don't have to go through all the stuff. Well, you, you do realize that when he comes back, when he raptures out his church, that those that are not saved are doomed. Your friends, family, my friends, family, co-workers. I mean, and, and if we believe the urgency, the hour truly is what it is, as, as Christians, not just us, but Christianity as a whole, it doesn't really seem like we believe that. And so so my, my goal for me and uh, my goal for our church is, is we're going to live like Jesus is coming back. And, and we're going to be busy. And, and I know we talk about burnout, and, uh, you know, we can go through all that. And I, I understand that, you know, w w we try not to have something at church every night, right? I mean, we, we, we don't have Bible study on Monday night and soul winter on Tuesday night. And, you know, we don't do something every night. So, so my thing is when we do have something, then, then there ought to be a good attendance to it. You know, the emphasis should be on the things we are doing and not always, well, we need to do more in these particular areas. So... That being said, I, I feel like sometimes, and we mentioned this, that we put so much emphasis on the organization of the church to do more that it takes the responsibility off of us as individuals to do more. Right. And so we don't necessarily have to have soul winning every week for all of us to take, you know, a, a pack of 20 tracks and hand out. That should be as adults and Christians that love Jesus, that should be pretty much what we do, I think. Yeah. So... Anyway, and I'm looking forward to uh, the meetings we're having next year. Look forward to Winter Jubilee coming up. Um, I'll tell you kind of what we've got coming up as far as that. So, and you'll get a calendar first of the year. Let me say this. We don't just print the calendars to waste paper. We give them to you so you can kind of plan your whole year around stuff going on. And I know it doesn't always work out, but um, uh, Brother Benji Bowden, missionary, is going to be with us on Sunday for our uh, winter Jubilee that morning, and then Brother Ted Ricci will be with us Sunday night, and then Monday through Thursday, uh, Brother Barry Rackley will be with us, and then we'll have Brother Barker coming for a missions revival uh, in June, and then for our August revival uh, that Sunday for homecoming, Brother Chris Simpson 
Uh, Brother Chris pastored Walter's Grove for many years. Now he's in evangelism. He's going to be with us Sunday. And then Brother Ralph's going to be with us Monday through Thursday. So uh, that's so far what we have on the agenda meeting-wise. So I hope you'll make plans to be here for those. And uh, ask God to, to move in that and be praying about it already. All right. Well, let's look at uh, Proverbs chapter 30. And begin verse number 24. And uh, when you, you see the title of the message, Four Insignificant Things, here's what I mean by that. W when I tell you these things, when we read the scripture, you're going to look at it and you're going to think that these things are not that big a deal. And, and what I want to preface the message is that, that little things have big impacts. right? I mean, uh, you think, well, me praying, that's not a big deal. It's a big deal, right? And, and me coming to church is not a big deal. Me reading a chapter of the Bible is not... But when you start stacking those things up, now all of a sudden you've developed a habit, right? You, you've developed a, and habits determine your character, right? right? And so the Bible starts out in verse 24, the Bible said there, there be four things which are little upon the earth. See, we like big, don't we? Everything, we like big stuff, right? You look at a church and people say, man, that church, God's really blessing it. What do you mean by that? Well, look at all the people coming. Well, that doesn't mean anything, right? I mean, you, you can have a coliseum full of people and uh, can entertain them or you can give them a, you know, sermon ed or whatever. And so that, that doesn't matter. God, God can, we sing little as much when God is in it, but then we don't really act like we believe it, right? And, and so we're, we learn here that, that with, there are four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. The Bible said, first of all, the ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. The conies are but a feeble folk, yet that make their houses, uh, make they their houses in the rocks. And the locusts have no king, yet go they forth all of them by bands. And then the spider taketh hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. Now, don't be grieved because I know some of you feel about spiders like I feel about snakes, right? So, so don't turn me off because you, I don't want to hear about the spiders. But think about this, that when you observe things that many times we take for granted, like I'll give you an example. How many of you, uh, if, this past year at our house, we had an exceptionally big problem with ants, I mean, we had them everywhere. I, I called the exterminator. I said, they're around our house. They're in the yard. They've been out ant hills, and they've done. And so he came. You, never, you, you, don't think, you think of it as a nuisance, not something we can learn from. And a lot of things in life, whether it be a, a sunset or a sunrise or a tree or grass or whatever it is that we take for granted every day that we see as a small thing, God's can use those things to teach lessons to us. And even children, we look at children and we'll say, well, they don't know the Bible and man. But, but isn't it interesting how God uses in his word and, and Jesus used the child as an example of faith and how that we're to take those small things that may seem insignificant but that God can do great things with. And so he noticed them, the, song, uh, the proverb uh, uh, writer noticed they, them because they're exceeding wise. They're not exceeding great, they're exceeding wise. And sometimes we miss the wisdom of God because we're looking for the, the, uh, the bigness of it, the, the, the magnitude of it. And how many times have you missed, and, and Brother Eddie, sometimes we'll say, man, I like to hear that guy preach. What do you like about Well, I like his delivery, and he's wild, and he's doing all, but, but what's, what's he delivering? Right? I mean, I can listen to a guy that may not, be as animated, but if, man, if he'll give you some meat in that word, I'm, I can listen to him too. Or you hear a singing group and they, man, they, well, they got the spirit on them. Well, what does that mean? Right? I mean, those girls got up here and sang, and if that, the message of that song did not resonate with your heart because they didn't have a, a pet band behind them, man, something's wrong. So sometimes we miss. The, the thing that God wants us to see in the small thing because we don't see the wisdom in it, right? And so that's really what he's showing us, what things we may miss because it isn't extravagant may provide us with the most wisdom. You ever talk to someone and, you know, they're not a, well, Johnny, they're not a big talker and maybe they don't have all the, uh, all the fancy words and maybe they're not eloquent in speech, but, but when, they, when they talk, when they talk to you, it's like, you better listen. Then there's some folks, they, 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 that's all they do is talk. 
You get no value out of it, right? It's just they, it's like they talk because they want to hear themselves talk, but you get nothing out of it. I, I'd, rather, I'd rather have someone give me a few words. And Paul said this. He said, look, I, I could speak in tongues more than you all, but I'd rather speak a few words that you understood. Right? And same thing with preaching. Man, you can preach for hours. And, and I've heard guys talk about, man, I, I can't preach less than 45 minutes or an hour. Or, or I've been in meetings, Brother Shane, and the, the preacher said, listen, everybody preach 15 minutes. And the guy get up and tell you 10 minutes of the message why he can't preach in 15. And I'm thinking, man, if you just get into it, you can say a lot in 15. So four things quickly that we see that, that uh, in this scripture that deals with wisdom is, first of all, he gives us in verse 24 a lesson in government. You say, well, that's kind of odd, preacher. Well, notice what he said in verse 24. He said, there are four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. Verse 25, the ant are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. Now, it's interesting to me that when you look at God's people, the Israelites, they were not the large nation. And that's really why he chose, one of the reasons he chose them, because they were insignificant and he would get glory out of using them, right? And so here we see that in this thing of government, and I'm not talking about the organization necessarily of government, but the way we do And there's government in everything, not just Washington. There's government within a church. There's government within a home. There's a government within your soul that there's something governing you or someone governing you to act in a certain way. And so he uses the example of the ant, and the first thing he talks about is their weakness. He said in verse 25, the ant are people that are not strong. Now, I don't know about you, but when you see an ant with this giant piece of food on its back, right? If you, if you look comparatively at what you and I could lift, we'd be like, that ant's pretty strong, right? Or if you look at the distance that small insect travels to go from there to there, you and I would probably have a heart attack and die. But our perception is that it's an insignificant. If you had a, a, a pack animal and you loaded it down with a lot of load, you'd say, man, that, that's a strong animal. But you could take that same thing and it would squish an ant. Right. But comparatively, right? right? Comparatively, we'd say, well, it's strong. But the perception is that it's weak. Yeah. And so their weakness, they're small. Yeah. They're weak, but on their own, they're something helpless. They're not, not much. But when you get a bunch of them going, right, and they're working together, yes, sir. we getting somewhere now? Yes, sir. See, God talks about his church, and he says that, that there's different parts of the body. There's some that are feet, and there's some that are eyes, and there's some that are hands, and everybody's not an eye. And if you're missing an eye or you're missing a hand, it, it makes the, it makes the, uh, the body uh, less mobile. It, it makes it less... Uh, uh, less uh, able to do what it needs to do. So we look at it, and you're, let me say this, you're important. You're important to this church. You're important to the cause of Christ. God has gifted you with something that, that he wants to use. And so just because you can't sing or play an instrument or preach or whatever, don't let the devil tell you you're not important because what he's saying is if you'll notice the ant, they all have a responsibility. They all chip in. Amen. Amen. You don't have spectator ants. You have workers. Amen. And, and that's what I want us to see going the next year. Don't be a spectator. You, you may not be able to run a bus, but maybe you could go out Saturday and knock on some doors. You may not be able to sing in the choir, but you sure can smile at them. Or you could help in the nursery where some of the nursery workers that sing in the choir could sing in the... You see what I'm saying? you got to find out in your, in your economy... The economy of our church that you say God led you to where you fit in and get involved. And so their weakness, but then you see their work. In verse 25, the ant are people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. Now that don't sound like us. Because let's be honest, most people that you and I know are procrastinators. We... We don't look at what is ahead. We look at what's right now. Right? right? I must have hit a nerve. We got quiet all of a sudden. Everything is an emergency because we don't plan 
And we, we, we react instead of being proactive, right? We come the end of the year, we're like, oh, i got to get all this done. The end of the year, it's Christmas time. I, I'm not ready for it. How can you not be ready for it? It happens the same time every year. Now, Easter's different. I don't know who came up with that, but they just, they, they were not, they didn't love Jesus, I don't think, because there's it's different all the time, right? But Christmas, the 25th, it happens every year. Some of you, I, I guess we need to go ahead and give an altar call because some of you, you're already staring at the floor and we had not got to the praying part yet, right? But see, they work diligently. It's not just when they got to do it. They're making preparations for time ahead. Now, how many Christians do you think when they stand before the Lord Jesus at the great white throne or the bema seat of Christ, right? Not the great white throne. You're there. You're in trouble. The bema seat of Christ. And they're going, well, Lord, I, if I'd have had more time. How many people's going to be in hell because they say, well, you know, if I'd have had more time. How many, how many times do you go to someone and say, listen, can you, well, I don't have time. I wish I had more time this year to do, I wish, hey, listen, I, I wish I had more time to read a book. You had 12 months. Yeah, but you don't understand how busy I am. And what I understand is you got 24 hours in a day like everybody else. How you choose to spend it's up to you, right? So a lot of times we miss the fact that God wants us working. I'd like to get more involved with church, but I don't have time. Well, what you're saying is you don't want to cut some things out of your life to make time for these things. Right? I mean, we're all the same. There's nobody in here that if you chose to, you couldn't stay busy 24-7 doing stuff. But see, you've got to make a decision what the important work is in your life. When you're dead and gone, listen, some of the stuff that you saw, they don't, your company that you're trying, well, i got to move up the corporate ladder. As soon as you die, they're going to put somebody else in there. Yes, sir. Now, I don't know if you figured it out, but when you're of no use to them, they'll cut you loose. Right? So, so let me say this, young person. Well, you know, I, I gotta, I'm part of this ball team, and that's so important. I, I'm all for it. I love sports. I think it teaches uh, some, some good principles, right? right? Working together, working hard. Te- I, but I'm, I'm not trying to be mean, but most of you ain't going to be a pro ball player. So if you're willing to give up recreation for serving God, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt you. By the way, a lot of times that's not the kids' fault. It's parents want to live through their kids. See, they work diligent, but they work for a purpose. Let me ask you this. How much of what you do really matters? You, you, can, you can be busy and not get anything done, or you can find out the important things to do and do the important things. Right? I'm busy. Preacher, I'm busy all the time. But what are you doing? Right? How many, how many of you like me? I like to do lists. I got lists, lists, lists. And a lot of times the important things don't get done because I get bogged down on the trivial things because they're easy targets, right? And before you know it, the day's gone. And I've done this thing and this thing and this thing, but I never did clean out the garage. And we go, you know what we do? Brother Bart was, I got a lot done today, but you didn't get the important things done. Same thing spiritually. You can do a lot, but if you don't get the important things done, you've missed working diligently and working uh, for a purpose. But notice this, with an ant, everyone works. Everybody does, right? You're not going to sit on a pew and not do anything if you're in the ant world. You're going to work. And it seems like to me, if I'm, if I, maybe I'm wrong, you Bible, Bible scholars tell me if I'm wrong. Somewhere in the scriptures it said if a man doesn't work, he doesn't, maybe you know it too. But we look at that in the temporal world, but we don't look at it in the spiritual world. Study to show thyself approved tells me that there's some effort that has to go into the study to get the meat out of the word, right? Songs, listen, musicians, you've worked hard uh, with this Christmas stuff.
But, but, and I'm not, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying everything. I, but, but working ought to be the norm in the music. Singers, working ought to be the norm in the singing. Preachers, studying ought to be the norm in the preaching, right? Sunday school teachers, I don't care if you're teaching the toddlers, you making preparations for that, that uh, lesson you're teaching, they deserve just as much as when Brother Jimmy stands here and teaches auditorium class. But see, we all, well, I had stuff to do, but what was it? Was it important? Everyone has different abilities, so everybody contributes. Now watch this. The ant world is a socialist system. Now in your mind, you say, well, you know, you hear all about socialism. You say, well, if that will work for them, why won't it work for us? Listen closely. Because we're not ants. We're not ants. There has to be some type of incentive or reward for most people to do anything. You wouldn't go into your job and say, listen, you don't have to pay me. I just, I just want to work diligently and hard so I came in today and you don't have to pay me anything. I mean, most people, let's be honest, you agreed to work for a certain amount of dollars an hour and then you're complaining because they're not paying you what you think you ought to get. So the ant has a lesson for us. Then, verse number 26, the conies are but a feeble folk, yet make their, they their houses in the rocks. Let me ask this. We'll do a little Q&A. Who knows what a coney is? Tell me what it is. Like a little, well, maybe. What I read is like a little rodent. It's like a little rabbit. Look like a guinea pig. That's what I say, sister. Nasty looking thing. But it gives us a lesson in grace. How does it give us a lesson in grace? Well, as you study about the coney, the Bible said they're but a feeble folk. What's that mean? Well, the realization is this. The coney is a rodent that is feeble. It cannot fend off its foes. It's helpless. Right? It's not, it's, it's not, a, bat, it's not a, a wolverine or a tiger or something that's Attack it's right. something doesn't protect it. Right. Well, does that sound like us? Sure does. You say, Well, I'm gonna fight the devil, I'm gonna give him black eye, he'll kill you. Right. You're no match for him, right? We're to we're to resist the devil, right? So we have to understand that that this this coney is vulnerable to predators. Right. So are we. The Bible said, Oh, we like what? Sheep have gone astray. Well, why, does a, why do sheep need a shepherd? Because there's wolves out there that are trying to kill the sheep. Right? There's predators that are trying to destroy the sheep. The sheep cannot protect themselves, so there is a shepherd to protect the sheep. Psalm 23. We love it, don't we? The Lord is my... Amen. Amen. Praise God. We've got someone to look after us because... the. Our adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion seeketh the who may devour, right? So we realize tonight that we do have an enemy, we do have a predator, but we do have a shepherd tonight. So the realization that those conies, even in great numbers, they have no protection from the enemy. Then there's the refuge. Notice we go on in the scripture, the Bible said that yet make they, make they their houses in the rocks. Well, I'm, I'm getting ready to have me a little bit of a running spell here. Isn't it interesting? I was studying a message about the stone. Think about this. When, when the stone was rolled away from the tomb, that stone, it was a barrier. It kept the world out but kept salvation in, right? The stone had to be removed for them to get where Jesus was. I'm glad he wasn't there when they got in, amen. He was already gone. But then also, we see in Scripture that the rock or the stone is a picture of Christ. So you study the Old Testament, you see 
over and over, water from the rock, right? Well, you see the, the altar of the rock. And now the Bible here is in Proverbs uh, chapter 30. It's talking about these conies, these feeble animals that are making their houses. Where at? Amen. D didn't say tents. It seems like that house, Brother Barry, is a more permanent structure than a sojourner. In other words, it seems like it's saying that they, <laughs> that they dwell in the rocks, not just pass through. So when, when we look at the refuge, it's not that just once in a while I pray when something bad's going on. It's not that I just come to church when things are bad. It is that I am abiding. The Bible tells us we're to abide in Christ. Not just, hey, when I got time, Lord, I'll make some time. No, no, that, see, when you look at what Paul said, Paul used this illustration. He said that I may know Christ. Not about him, but I may know him. But Miss Vonnie, here's how he said he knew him in his suffering. In the power of his resurrection and in his suffering. See, we don't like that part. We want to know him without the suffering part. We only want to come to the refuge of the rock when things are bad. If you want to know him, you've got to abide with him. Amen. Listen, that, that's, uh, that is the problem with Christianity today. We don't want, we want, here's what it is. We want to make him a part of our life. Paul's saying that I may know him, which means that he is his life. He is the pinnacle of the Christian's life. That intimacy, Paul met him on the road to Damascus. He already knew, watch this, it's not just an intellectual experience because Paul knew uh, before he ever went to Damascus that day, he believed that there was a God, right? He believed there was a Messiah, right? The Jews believed those things because of the Old Testament. Here's the problem. He'd never met him. When he met him, it changed him. There's a lot of folks, Brother Brad, sitting in our churches that they grown up in church and they know about him. But they never met him. That's right. When you meet him, praise God, it changed you. And it's not a one time experience that just, well, I got saved, now I'm no, no. It's not a I signed the paper, now I'm not going to hell. When you really know him, Paul was never the same. That's right. He didn't go back to being religious, praise God. When he met Jesus, he tossed off the old man, praise God. Now he said, I'm I'm going with him. And what we need is that kind of experience. Amen. So here he is. And when you have that, you realize that your refuge, that you're no match for Satan. You're no match for the enemy. Their refuge is the rock, and their nails allow them to cling on. Listen to me. Sometimes you just got to hold on. Yeah. Right. Amen. Sometimes you just, hey, I, don't, I may not. The, you, you might go somewhere in the storm. The rock ain't going anywhere. Sometimes you just got to hang on. So they were the refuge. Number three, a lesson in growth. Verse 27. said, the locust have no king, yet go they forth out all of them in by, by bands. And so it gives us a lesson in growth. What do you mean by that? Well, I won't go into a lot of detail, but does anybody know what a locust is? The grasshopper. Well, we, you know. Well, we don't just call them grasshoppers, but, but something happens to them. The locust goes through several stages in life. It starts out as a grasshopper, and a mysterious force affects the locust, and the grasshopper finds a suitable twig, hangs upon uh, upside down, breaks out of its body, pumps blood into its wings, and becomes a locust. There's something about blood in it. See, you can't have life without blood. 
You can't have eternal life without blood. The blood changes us. It regenerates us. And so the picture is a metamorphosis that takes place of salvation. That the, the locust was one thing, but then when it went through the metamorphosis, which is what salvation is, a metamorphosis, then it, became, it came out the other side something different. Yeah, man. It didn't come out a grasshopper. It came out a locust. And so you and I have to realize that when a person is regenerated, he enters into a new life. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And, and matter of fact, I, uh, the Bible says this, that uh, that which is born of flesh is what? That which is born of spirit is. So when we look at the new birth, think about this. That the reason we can have new birth in Jesus, and again, I, I'm not getting graphic, but Jesus was a product of the Holy Spirit. There was a spiritual uh, act that took place where Mary uh, had the, uh, Jesus in her womb. That is a new birth. That is a spiritual birth, right? The picture is a spiritual birth. The, you get saved when the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of you. The physical birth was a natural birth between a man and a woman. And, and again, the picture is their love for each other and the, the product or the fruit of that is a child. But that child is a sinner because it's born of a sinful man, sinful woman. And so it, Jesus had to be born a, spirit, a spiritual being and could not be born from a man. Had to be born of God. Amen? That's why Mary had to be a virgin. And the picture is the new birth. That which is born of flesh is flesh. So if you never get born again, you can have all the works of the flesh you want and think, man, I'm doing pretty good, but you're still flesh. Amen. To be born of the Spirit means a spiritual transaction took place, a spiritual birth took place, and that is the fact that the Holy Spirit comes to reside inside of you. Amen. The only way it can happen. So the regeneration of this Grasshopper to a locust is a metamorphosis that takes place and it comes out the other side of that different than it went in. So not only do you see that in verse 27, the locusts have no king yet go they forth out all of them by bands. There's also the picture of revival. Now what do you mean by that? Well there are times when there are a few isolated groups. Maybe a locust here, maybe a small band here, right? But then something happens, right? Something brings them together in larger groups. They enter this stage to survive their hostile environment. Are we in a hostile environment? Yeah. Right? And so when the locusts change their behavior, the numbers grow. Right? When they, when they, get, when they get away from this whole, look at our group, we're going to do our thing in this group, we're going to go do our thing. They say, hey, maybe we need to work together in this thing because we're fighting the same enemy. They come together, and guess what? Then you have this swarm of locusts. Right, and so when the people of God change their behavior uh, and put themselves at the disposal of the Holy Spirit, the church becomes a power to be reckoned with. Listen, we, you, can, you can go hand out all tracts you want to, but if you don't season that with prayer... It's a work of God. We're just a, the, we're the laborers. The work is Him. We can have all the right music and all the right. We can carry a King James Bible. We can have a, you know the right standards and that. See, that's where we as Baptists have messed up for a long time. We think our holiness was God is these little things we do. And we can check our boxes. Yet we have no power of the Holy Spirit of God, right? And so what we try to do is we'll, we'll have revival. And we'll say we're going man. What God showed up? Why why did He show up? Well, because we had this singing group and we worked stuff up. I mean, that, let's be honest. A lot of what we call the spirit moving is just emotionalism. Right? Don't, it doesn't change people. For a little while, it, they'll come, hey, no, I'm not saying it never happens. But no, I'm not saying it never happens. Some people are sincere. But as a, as a vast majority, we'll have, you know, church have a service and somebody... Oh, well, Brother Johnny, he thought he was saved, but he, he, God dealt with him. Right. Well, that's happened 14 times. Right. Now, I'm not telling people, listen, if you're not saved, you need to get saved. I'm telling you that. Right. 
But Brother Foy, I think we've made a mess of this thing. Because people have no confidence in, their, in salvation. Right. Right? right? I mean, I don't know about you, but you can't have victory if you don't know you're saved. Right. We're, we got people doubting. Well, man, I'll tell you what. Well, some of that's emotionalism, right? right? If you don't do this, don't do that. You think this way and you've ever done it, you're probably not saved. I don't know. <laughs> right? Peter probably wasn't in, right? Peter, every time he turned around, he's backslid. Paul, you know, oh, if you ever doubted God, you're probably not saved. Well, John the Baptist in hell then. John the Baptist was in prison. He said, look, told his disciples, he said, you go make sure that he's the one I'm, I'm talking about, right? Paul, greatest Christian we probably know. Things I should do, I don't do. The things I shouldn't do, I do. Right. Oh, wretched man that I am, right? We better be careful. With so what happens is we just keep filtering through. We'll say, oh, we had revival. Did you? I said this before. They asked the great Welsh revival. asked the 84-year-old lady. said, listen, you were part of that revival when you were a girl. How long did it change you for? She said, I'm still not the same. That's what revival is, that God changes us. And so I believe this, that when you and I realize that, uh, that uh, our behavior has to change. By the way, you're never, as a church, as an individual, you're never going to have revival until repentance comes. Amen. See, we don't, we, we don't want all that. We just want the action. We want the atmosphere of revival, but we don't want to take, we don't want the prerequisite of getting right with God. So you got... So what we do is we'll say, well, you know, you just come. And people come to the altar. Oh, he got, he got saved. Probably wasn't saved. Well, let me, let me help you with this. So when we look at the prodigal son, right? Now that fellow was way out, was he not? He left the father, said, give me, give me what's mine. The Bible said he wasted it all with riotous living, right? Partying with his buddies. His buddies left him. He was in the hog pit, all right? Well, that, listen, for a Jew, that was the worst place you could be. Down the hog pit. Well, was he still the father's kid? Sure was. Well, when he came to, the Bible said he came to himself. Is that what it said? Yes, well, was he instantaneously transported from the hog pit to the father's house? Had to go back the same way he went. Right. So, see, a lot of times what we're doing is we're telling people, listen, you're probably not saved because you're in the hog pit. What you need to do is just get saved, and then you'll go right back to the father's house. And a lot of times they are saved, Brother Bart, but... They're away from God, and instead of taking that long journey back Good. of repentance, Good. we want to instantaneously go from the hog pit right back to the good graces of the Father. Now, I understand this. I'm not saying we earn our way back, but there are some lessons you've got to learn on the way back. Right. The relationship and the fellowship's restored, but listen, the chastisement of God can still come because of decisions we made. Am I right? So what happens is we just, well, you're, you're probably not saved. Well, maybe, or maybe they're just backslid on God in the hog pit, and what they need is to be left alone for God to deal with them, right? right. Instead of convincing them all they got to do is get re-saved. Right. Yes, I'll, get, I'll get stoned by the brethren for sure for that one. I mean... We make a mess out of this thing. And the thing is, just sometimes you just need to get right with God and realize that the, the, the fellowship that, listen, fellas, here's, here, give you this example. Let's say, let's say, let's say you step out on your wife. She forgives you. Well, she ain't going to trust you. I don't blame her. 
Well, I said I was sorry. You said you forgave me. Everything ought to be like it was before. No, it shouldn't. You got to get back there. Right? You got to get back there. You got to prove that you're different. That's what repentance is. We say that's a 180 degree turn. Yeah, but guess what? If you don't start walking in that direction, you're still in the same spot and you can take another 180 degree turn and be right back where you was at. So, so, I got to quit. So there's a lesson in growth that you and I, we can't stay where we are. We got to get better. And the way you get better is to, first of all, you got to be regenerated. You got to be saved. And then after that, you got to, you got to be revived. And then number four, there's a lesson in glory. Well, I like this, praise God. And some of you won't because it talks about a spider, but don't, don't get caught up in the spider. Bible says in verse 28, the spider taught, or taketh hold with her hands. Notice this, and it is in the king's palace. No, so it gives us a lesson in glory. What do you mean? Well, could we, could we agree, could we agree that most of us would think the spider is a villain? I would, right? At least to the insect world, I, I think if you probably ask the fly, the spider is the villain in the story, right? And so it's a murder. I mean, matter of fact, fellas, think about how blessed we are that we're not men spiders because the female spider kills and eats her husband on the honeymoon. <laughs> Hallelujah. That ain't no spider. Be graveyard dead. You, you, you don't want, I mean, what do you do? Hello, Miss Spider. You sure are pretty. I sure would like to marry you. Oh, I'd like to marry you too. You're a chunky fella and you look like you're going to be eat good on our honeymoon. Right? And when you think about it, the spider, what is their role? They kill stuff and eat it their whole life. That's what they do. And so when you look at it, can we agree that we're villains? We're sinners. We don't deserve God or His grace. But notice the notice the, the help in this verse. The Bible says the spider takes hold with her hands and is in where? King's palace. What does that mean? It gives us the victory that yet even spiders can be found in the palace. It, it, it helps me that we through Jesus will find ourselves in the presence of the king one day. Amen. See the devil's going to keep beating you down telling tell what you are not. But through the grace of God, God shows us what we can be. Don't, don't, don't let your past define you. The Bible said we're more than conquerors through Christ, right? The devil's going to keep bringing up your past. Oh, you, you love Jesus. Not a, you, well, guess what? It's in the rearview mirror. Windshield's bigger than the rearview mirror. I'm more concerned about what's ahead than what's behind. Amen. 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 God's good to us. Amen. Let's gather around the altar and pray.